Hello, this is Erica Henkel. Um, today we're going to talk about chapter two, um, where we are going to be going into more depth about the categorical data that we talked about in chapter one. And we're going to talk about how we can display and describe that data appropriately. So, um, what we will often use as a table to display some of our categorical data is what's called a frequency table. And it, it's basically just a set of rows and columns that have information about how often a particular combination of uh, characteristics occurred in our data. So it'll report counts and sometimes percentages of how often things will occur. Um, looking at an example where we have people who are going to go watch the Super Bowl, and a lot of you guys are going to probably do that next month, or, um, and some people like to watch the game, some people like to watch just the commercials, um, some people aren't really sure if they're going to watch it or not, um, some people know that they're definitely not going to watch it, they're going to do something else. So we have 40 responses from a poll um, regarding what people's interest level is in the Super Bowl. Now, if we take all this information and we just throw it all out there so you can look at it, it's not very informative about how many people are doing what during the game. So we try to take all of that and we try to count how many times each of these particular um, characteristics occurs, such as won't watch, won't watch, won't watch. Um, we see that. Um, and then we will go ahead and put those counts into another table so that we can summarize how many times these different um, traits are occurring in, in our survey. So we have people who are watching the commercials. Of those, um, we had eight people watching commercials out of the 40 who responded, which makes up 20% of our respondents. And then we had 18 people who wanted to watch the game. We had 12 people who won't watch it at all. And then we have two people who don't know. And then this frequency table is showing how many people had each response as well as what percentage those people were out of our total number of respondents that we had. So um, once we've got this data, we've got three rules. If you want to make your data understandable and really tell a story to people, make a picture, make a picture, make a picture. It shows people intuitively things that they aren't going to understand necessarily by just looking at a big pile of numbers even. So while we have, um, you know, we've got three different steps we've been looking at here. First, just all the data dumped out on a page, not super understandable. Then we looked at it in a frequency table, which was helpful. And then now we're going to look at how we can effectively portray that information in a visual format for people to understand. Um, and it helps you see different patterns that you might not be able to see otherwise. Now, one of the key rules we want to watch out for here is what's called the area principle. And that means that however, whatever portion of your responses a particular um, data point represents, we want to make sure that we are displaying it with an appropriate area within our visual display. Because if we look at this here, all right, we have, um, we have our, direct response. Um, so this is uh, what we're looking at here is how many uh, hits to the Keen website were generated by each of these particular um, sources, right? So um, we've got Google that ha was responsible for 130,000 visits and then um, direct access, which was responsible for 52,000 visits. Now, they laid this all out here based on the width of the graph, and they used this kind of cool looking shoe graphic to do this. However, the problem is that they were doing this based on the length of the shoe, not how much overall space in this picture that um, the shoe took up, right? So if we looked at it based on that, um, it gives us a wrong answer because it looks like the shoe only takes up about a third of the whole total space of this graph. Now, out of 226,000 responses, Google was responsible for um, well over half. So from an area perspective, it should have been taking up more like this whole area. And then also the other problem with these shoes is that if, if when you look at them in comparison, they don't give you a proper 
perspective of how the two, uh, like we'll just look at Google and Direct here, right? How many of these shoes can fit in here? One, two, three, four, five, maybe six shoes. Um, but what, when we look over here, um, the direct response was um, was not one sixth of 130,000. It was like a third. So um, actually more than a third even. So that shoe should have been taking up a much larger space in order to be really comparative. So it's not giving you a good perspective between these two particular um, responses that people have. Now, um, looking more at this area principle, we're going to kind of, we're going to look at some better displays of the same data that do um, observe that area principle, all right? So here we've got a simple bar chart, and this shows the dis distribution of these same variables, only in here you can see, all right, look at this. This is almost half, uh, more than a third, almost half visually speaking on here, right? Um, and so that just gives you a much more intuitive understanding of how those two particular um, data types um, compared to each other when we're looking at their various categories. So um, we can take that same, and if you notice here, they had this in numbers on the y-axis here. Um, if we go to the next screen, they changed it to the percentage, and you know what? The perspective is still the same here um, for these, even though we're looking at a percentage instead of the numbers on the side. So that just shows us um, that even though we're measure using a different measurement reference, um, it's still giving us the correct proportion between the various responses here. Now, if we took the same data and we put it into a pie chart, um, we would be looking at um, slices proportional um, to the part of the pie that they each took up. So Google takes up more than half of this pie. Um, direct is about not quite a quarter of the whole thing, but is um, more than a third uh, of what the Google is. So we've got a better perspective here also with the pie chart. Now the disadvantage here with how they, if I was gonna decide what to use, I liked the bar chart better because it displayed the small items more appropriately. If you get into a pie chart and you start having little teeny weeny slices like this, then that's not really ideal because it's kind of hard to pick out like, oh, I think the mobile's pointing at purple, but if I was seeing this up on a giant screen on the wall, would I be able to tell that was purple? Um, would I be able to tell that the Facebook slice was pink? Would I be able to tell the difference between the two super easily? Not really. So, I mean, the pie chart does work here and it gives you the proper area principle, but again, not necessarily ideal. Now, um, before we are making any kind of a chart though, we need to make sure that we have distinct categories for each section. Um, we aren't overlapping categories. We don't have things that are actually in more than one category because if you include the same response in more than one bar, then you're gonna skew the size of that bar relative to how many actual responses you had. So you always wanna make sure that you're taking one response for one category and you're not combining them together. And then you also want to look at, all right, what am I trying to tell people with this data? And is what they are seeing from this going to accurate, be accurate compared to what, what I'm actually trying to say? Now, um, we can also do what's called a contingency table to show how different um, data categories are distributed among each that variable. So we can break it out into subcategories essentially, and we can look at it in both counts and percentages. Now the marginal distribution of one of your variables is the total count that happens um, for that variable. And then when we're looking at our cells of our contingency table, um, so each one of these particular boxes here is a cell, right? So when we're looking at one cell here, um, that gives us the count for a combination of two variables. So the variables here are the count and um, social networking. Whether So in this particular case, we're moving on to a new case and they're talking about whether people used social networking, yes or no, or they did not have access to it. And they did this from a bunch of different countries and, they, and in this particular section, they lumped it all together, right? So um, they had 32,000 people who did not have access, 43,000 people who used social media, 
and then they had um, 24,000 that did not use social media. So yes, no, this is the count, and then this is the percentage here, the relative frequency. Now, when we go into this, it's not super helpful to tell us like across the world how many people are using social media. It might be more interesting for people if they could look at how it varied from one country to the next. So on this slide, that's exactly what they did. They broke it out into multiple different categories. So here we've got our, uh, we've got different countries up here across the top with our total over here. And again, these are all counts here. Um, so this is our frequency. And then they have the um, marginal frequency would be each of these boxes in comparison. Now, um, so the marginal frequency for the US is 293 out of the 1,249 no responses or the 506 yes of the yes responses. Um, now, once we have that, you can look at that in counts. You can also add in another section so you can see that based on percentages. Um, you can restrict the percentages to look at a conditional distribution. So um, are these countries similar in use? So a conditional distribution would be, you know, how many of the US um, were not using social media? How many of the US were using social media? Um, so if you're looking only at respondents from the US, that's the condition. Um, what number or percentage were using social media and not using social media? Now, um, variables can sometimes uh, relate to um, distributions. Sometimes they're related, sometimes they're not related. And so we can break this out and we can say, hmm, I wonder if there's an association between some of our variables. So we're going to go back to our Super Bowl example here and we're going to say, I wonder if there is an association between um, people's genders and whether they are going to watch the game, whether they're going to watch commercials, whether they won't watch or whether they don't know. So how would we figure that out? Well, if we look at this, we would want to figure out the conditional distribution then um, for men versus women. So in order to do that, we're going to say, all right, we had 277 men that are going to watch the game divided by the total number of men that was polled. We have 79 men that are watching just for the commercials out of 492 men that were polled. So that means that um, the conditional distribution here is 56.3% of men are watching the game. 16.1% of men are watching for commercials. Over here, we've got 29.8% of women who are watching for commercials and 38.4% of women who are watching the game. So 56 versus 38 from men to women percentage wise, that's a huge gap. We also have 16% of men who are watching for the commercials versus 29.8 for women. So again, a huge gap between those two, those two genders there. So if we look at those side by side in bar charts uh, to compare this, um, then there seems to be an association that we can see here between gender and some of these answers. If there was not an association between gender, we would expect that these two for the game would be relatively close. They wouldn't necessarily be exactly the same because you're going to have some differences every time you run a poll, but they would be pretty close to each other. And here we just have, we have large differences in, in all three of these main categories here. So, um, if we wanted to break these out more, um, we can do what's called a segmented bar chart. So we, we did a bar chart, basic one. We did a side-by-side -side bar chart where we had men versus women. And then now we're going to talk about segmented bar charts here. And, and, and also another type of segment chart called a mosaic plot. So um, in 1912, uh, the famous ship, the Titanic, sank. Uh, and there were almost 1,500 passengers on board, plus there were crew members. So total of um, 2,201 people that were on the ship. 
And we have um, whether they were dead or alive after all of this uh, broken out by first class, second class, third class, and whether they were crew. And we show here um, both counts and uh, percentages for this. Now, if we look at this in a side-by-side -side bar chart, we've got our conditional distribution of survival, um, whether alive or dead, for each ticket class, all right? So we've got first class, second class, third class, and crew, blue is alive. So look at how many people were alive from first class. A lot more were alive than dead. In second class, there was a lot more dead than alive. In third and crew, that gets even more so. So the they had the, uh, least amount in comparison that were alive in comparison to dead. So that's a side-by-side -side bar chart. Now, here's what we call a segmented bar chart here. Um, we've got alive on the left and dead on the right, and they put both of them on a percentage scale here. So if we take everybody, 100% of people who were alive, this portion came from first class, this portion came from second class, this portion came from third class, and this portion came from the crew. Now, we can see that, um, interestingly, so we had the uh, second, percent, uh, second class was the lowest percent there. Now, um, of the people who were dead, we had um, a really large portion from the crew and third, and then we had smaller portions from second and first. Now, what's really confusing about these particular segmented bar charts is that it makes it look, if you just glance at this, like we had the same number of people that were alive and the same number of people that were dead. Um, just visually, right? I mean, yes, we have the percentage on the side, but it doesn't tell you numerically about how many people died, really. You have no way of judging that, um, how many people lived, how many people died in comparison to each other. So that's not ideal um, because that area of principle is being violated. Now, if we go to our um, mosaic plot, which is really similar to the segmented bar chart, only they widen these out uh, or make them narrower in comparison so that you can reflectively see how many people were dead versus alive. So it look, if you look at this here, like, wow, it's almost twice as many people over here that are dead as alive. So that gives you a much bigger perspective. And so then you see, all right, area-wise, this is how many people from crew were alive, and this is how many people from crew were dead. So it's a lot more, probably four times more died, right? Same thing here with the third class. Second class, maybe twice as many people, uh, maybe not. It's a little harder to tell because they're not lined up next to each other. But um, we had definitely a lot more people who survived um, from first class than, than died from the looks of it, just, just looking at this. It's difficult with the different shapes, but area-wise, at least it gives you a better idea. Now, uh, last topic for chapter two is what's called Simpson's Paradox. If you are going to combine percentages together across different values or groups, you can really confuse people together. Uh, so if you were to take two groups and put them together that might not really be related to each other, you can make numbers say something that they're not saying. So how, what's a good example of that? Well, here we have two salespeople. So um, Peter and Katrina are selling two different primary products, printer paper and USB flash drives, right? Um, out of printer paper, Peter sells 90 out of 100 um, prospects he, that he manages to successfully sell to. So 90% of his printer paper, and then out of his USB flash drives, he only sells 10 out of 20, so 50%. But if you add those two together, the printer paper and the flash drives, then Peter is selling 100 out of, uh, he's successfully selling to 100 out of 120 prospects, which is 83%. Now, if we look at Katrina, Katrina is selling to 19 out of 20 of her paper prospects, so 95%, higher percentage than Peter, and she's selling 75 out of 100% of her USB flash drives, 75%, 
also higher than Peter. But wait, you add those two together and suddenly Katrina is selling 94 out of 120, which is only 78%. So on a prospect by prospect basis, she is selling fewer. But if you look at relative in each percentage, she is still selling more. So this is an example how you can have, say, say the USB flash drives are a lot harder to sell, but she's selling 75% of them. Um, maybe anybody and their brother can sell printer paper and she's selling 95%, he's only selling 90. Um, so these printer paper have different users probably, um, different difficulty of selling, different need from people than a memory device, which is a hardware item. So you can't really combine those two categories together for products just because they're both being sold. So you wanna watch out for stuff like that and say, well, are, is this really apples to apples? Um, are these really segments that I'm combining together here? Probably not. Okay. so. Um, what can go wrong here with our data? Well, um, don't violate that area principle, all right? We, we've beaten that one to death. Um, also, keep it honest. Um, make sure that you're not having um, percentages that add up to more than 100% because it makes things look skewed. Um, make sure that you're looking at things properly here, right? So if you put more than 100% into a pie chart, it's gonna make 50% look like less than half. And that doesn't look right. It doesn't, so if you were looking at this, you'd be like, oh, they sold less than half, but no, they actually sold half, whatever. So, or they were using half in this particular case. Um, so make sure that intuitively what you're saying makes sense. And then don't change scales halfway through. So here they were running out of room at the top. So they started a brand new scale here. They didn't relabel it. And then it makes it look like they had a huge drop between 2008 and 2009 um, when probably they just continued growing. So don't change your scales halfway through. It doesn't work. Just change the scale for the whole thing so that you can still get a correct relative distribution. Um, and there's a few more points here you can look at within the slides, um, but basically this should get you going enough that you can step in on your sample problems. So watch out for that sample problems video next. That'll be the next thing that you are going to want to uh, work on.